Uh, for fans of The Chosen, right, the scene in today's gospel, you might have an image in your mind, right? Once you see it, you kind of can't think of another way to think about it. That's what our front cover picture comes from, that, that show that uh, a lot of us love. And uh, we'll, be getting, we'll be beginning our season three study soon, right? So we did, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, uh, we did a kind of a study discussion breakdown of seasons one and two. We'll start that with season three uh, in the spring. So once season three is done, we'll have some time to digest it. Then we'll start our, our breakdown in the spring. So uh, this scene is a powerful scene in season one. Jesus calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And I want to focus on one little detail in the story that maybe we might miss or just not think is that important. But Matthew puts it in. And Matthew wants us to understand it's a significant detail. And it's about them leaving their nets. Right? He says, immediately, this is Peter and um, Andrew. He says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then he kind of makes it even kind of a grander gesture for James and John. They were in the boat with their father. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him, right? So they're all leaving something behind. So I want to just visit a little bit about what uh, a fisherman's life was like and why that's important, and then fast forward it to us of what that might mean for us. So in Jesus' time, if you were a fisherman, that was your trade, that was your job. You learned it from your father. That's how you learn trades. There was no uh, vocational schools, there weren't real universities like we understand. You know, we have conversations with our kids about go, explore, kind of figure out what your passion is, what you want to do, go to school, find your way, right? In Jesus' time, they had no conversations like that. The conversations were, my father was a fisherman, I'm a fisherman, you're going to be a fisherman, discussion over. That was kind of how um, career counseling worked back in Jesus' day. <laughs> so if you had a trade, if you were a blacksmith, if you were a carpenter, if you were a stonemason, if you were a fisherman, if you were any type of trade, you learned that from your father, and that was going to be your job, and you knew that from a young age, so that you would start learning the trade at six or seven or eight years old. Right? If you were in agriculture, you would learn that trade at six or seven or eight years old. So that the idea would be, you would be ready to step in and participate in the trade as soon as you could, right? 15, 16 years old, right after, you know, a, a Jewish boy would have their bar mitzvah at 13. It was kind of like their graduation. And so shortly after that, you'd be expected to step in and start participating in the family trade. That was how it worked. Well... There's multiple reasons for that. One is there, there just wasn't the system to train for vocations and callings and jobs like we have today. And the other is it's how you supported the family. Right? There was a way a family economy worked, right? So it would be uh, fishing in this particular group of families. Fishing is how we provide for our families. So you're going to learn how to fish so that you have a trade that you can provide not only for your children, but for your aging parents who might be too old to fish, right? So passing on the trade was also a way of right, taking care of your parents who were elderly and taking care of your children who might be too young to participate in the trade. And so there was like this family economy that had to keep going through the learning of a trade, whether it be agriculture, whether it be uh, something we'd call like a vocational trade today. And so very few people in Jesus' time, unless you were really one of the upper class, had the opportunity to kind of explore you know, what they were going to do. Most people knew what they were going to do because it was going to be what their father did. And that was it. And so Peter and Andrew are brothers, and they're fishermen because their father was a fisherman. James and John are brothers, sons of Zebedee. We know their father's name. And they are fishermen because Zebedee was a fisherman. And that was their life. That is what they had trained their whole life to do. That was the one job that they did well. There was not uh, an, an economy open to them of possibilities. 
That, that was their spot. And so when Jesus comes by and sees them fishing and says, follow me, and they leave their nets and they leave their boat and they leave their father, right? what Matthew really wants us to know is that they are taking a huge leap. This isn't like, let's go see what Jesus is like for a couple days. right? They're leaving kind of their career behind. And not only that, they're dragging the family with them, right? Because whatever their scenarios were, we know Peter was married. Uh, we don't know if the others were married. We assume they weren't, but we don't know. But we know they had parents, and we know they had families. And so, right, their place of in the family economy, they're dragging everybody who's depending on them being a fisherman with them. And they're willing to leave those things behind. So they drop their nets, right? Matthew uh, tells us that, and it seems like a simple detail, but to those in his day, they would know what that meant. They're really taking a leap and willing to leave the only thing they've ever been trained to do behind for this. And not only that, Jesus is calling people who are not trained in kind of scripture or preaching or speaking, but people who are trained in other things. That's why one of the reasons um, Pharisees and educated people have such a problem with Jesus and his disciples is just because they don't have the pedigree. It doesn't work this way. Fishermen don't become prophets, right? Carpenters don't become prophets. It doesn't work that way. So they leave it behind and they follow him. Two sets of brothers. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Okay, so let's fast forward that to today and how we can think about the idea of dropping our nets. And this is what I've uh, come to think about. All of us, right, by nature of being here, have a hunger for God in our lives in some capacity, right? Now, not everyone's hunger is always the same intensity, but all of us are here because we have a hunger for God in our life. And there are times when our life is full, right? So to walk a little closer to the Lord or to have a little more of him in our life, we might need to drop something. Right? That's the idea of dropping our nets. It's not the same, Right? I'm not, nobody give up their career after this uh, sermon, but something, right? Something's got to give. I um, had a moment this week. Um, I got a wedding invitation for my nephew's wedding this fall. And see, here's the problem I'm not old enough to have nephews that are getting married. This is pro problem one, right? I'm not old enough to have nephews that are getting married. Um, and two, and, and those of you that have, had, uh, have watched people grow, those of you that have your children have gotten married, you understand this kind of weird moment when you, you, when you look at this person who's starting a life uh, professionally and personally, and you remember them when they were little kids and all the silly things they did and all that, right? It's a challenge. And I remember this kid who's going to be a lawyer and a husband and all these things in the next year. And I remember when he was younger and he used to love Hot Wheel cars. Right? A lot of boys love Hot Wheel cars. Right? We had, I had them when I was a kid. And he used to do this thing uh, when he was maybe three years old. Right? He used to love to carry them around with him in his hands. So he would pick up a car and he'd put it in his hand. And he'd pick up another car and he'd put it in his hand. He'd pick up another car and put it in his hand. He'd carry them around until a point, like three-year-olds, their hands aren't that big. Right? So a three-year-old, he'd, he'd be at capacity. And then he'd come across another car. He would look at it. He would look at his hands, look at the car, look at his hands. And eventually it would end with him looking at you and just starting to cry. Like, help me figure this out. And we would try to explain to him, you got to drop one of the cars. No. Well, then you can't pick up that car. No. Right? It would just be <laughs> this crying, this frustration, because he, he was at capacity. And I feel like there are times, right, when when we, we live our life like that, right? Whether it's um, inside things or outside things, I'm going to talk about the difference in just a second, but when we want something we know is good in our life and we're just like, where's it going to fit? Everything's full. Well, you got to drop something. No. Well, you can't have that then. No, I, I don't know. I'm just stuck, right? We, and I feel like we have those moments like that. And so I'm going to give you um, 
two examples. I don't know what dropping your nets mean for you. I'm going to give you two examples of things I've seen. Uh, the first one is, like I said, inside things. So this is kind of inside things. And I will tell you, if you wanted to ask me, what have I seen that holds people back from a, from a, a healthy and joyful relationship with God, it's usually inside things, right? It's things we carry that we don't want to let go. It's a wound. It's a scar. It's a, it's a bitterness. It's an anger. It's someone who hurt us. It's a, a bad relationship with a parent that we just won't let go of. Um, all those things. Right? Th usually things we've been um, the victim end of has been my experience. Um, I remember sitting down with someone who had a horrific relationship with their mother. A young man had a horrific relationship with their mother growing up. And um, we would talk about that relationship and how he thought, no, I'll, I'll be fine. Now that I'm away from her, I'm going to be fine. I just need to get out of the house, go away to college. I, I don't want to see her anymore. Now that I'm away from her, I'm going to be fine. But um, what he came to realize as he grew a little older was he carried that relationship. He may have been away from his mother, but he carried the relationship with her everywhere he went. And so there was a time we sat down and he said, uh, why do you think I can't have a healthy relationship with a woman? I've got an idea. It has something to do with your mother. Said, no, no, you're crazy. You're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. That's not it. Okay. So then about two years later, same young man, we had the conversation, and he said, you know what I realized? I can't have a healthy relationship with any female in my life because of my mother. And I said, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so you came to this conclusion, right? So here's the thing. He had carried that with him from a very young age into his early 20s, into his mid-20s, into his late 20s, into his early 30s until he was able to say, this is the thing I need to drop. And when he did, surprise, surprise, um, relationships started getting healthier in his life. Right? He was able to drop that. So uh, that's an example of inside things. Or I would say inside things. Things within our heart that we carry around, that weigh us down, that, that are wounds, that keep us from uh, joy to keep us from the abundant life that Jesus promised us. And sometimes it's outside things. So there's inside things and there's outside things. Outside things are just things in life that get put on us, right? Um, obligations and, and things we take on that fill us. And a lot of times they're meant to fill us with joy or they're meant to fill us with fulfillment, but sometimes they exhaust us, they wear us down, they give us um, none of those things. And so there are times in our life when we have to let go of an outside thing. And, you know, that can be more difficult because the outside things, usually we let people down when we, when we drop some of the outside things because they involve other people. But all of you have been in this situation when you have been, um, when, you're, when your plate has been so full of commitments and you dread them all, right? You, you're just like, I can't do one more thing but yet I have five more things this week, right? We've all been at that point. Sometimes it's an outside thing, and I don't know what that thing might be. I just had to um, deal with this uh, for myself, honestly. I'm not going to tell you what, what it is, but this was something I just had to deal with. I was doing some continuing education study, and um, I started enjoying it uh, when it began, but as kind of the time went on, it just became like one more obligation, one more thing to do, one more thing that I dreaded, you know, over the course of the cohort. And finally I said, I just got to put this down for a while because it started as something I enjoyed and now it's becoming an obligation that I absolutely dread. And it's just one more thing. It's taking me away from my church, my family, the things that I actually like doing. So um, it was an outside thing for me that I had to put down for my health. And I felt amazing, way better after uh, I was able to clear that space. So it might be an inside thing, it might be an outside thing, but this is what I've learned. Sometimes you just know. Sometimes you just know. I've sat with people who knew. I, I thought maybe it was my job as a wise priest, right, um, to try to help people figure out their thing. But a lot of times, within a minute, they knew. They knew exactly what that thing was. Whether it was an inside thing or an outside thing, 
that God was calling them to drop. Right In that moment, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they just knew. Jesus didn't give them follow-up instructions. He said, follow me. And they just knew what they needed to drop to make that happen. So I would encourage you just to think about that question. Right? If, if you indeed do want to create a little more space for a relationship with God in your life, or if you want to walk a little closer to the Lord, or if you're feeling like you're at capacity and you don't know what else you can take on, um, you might want to think about what is the net that Jesus is asking you to drop? Is it an inside thing? Is it an outside thing? What net is he asking you to lay down right now? And my guess is you'll know. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.